Hello and welcome to the Institute of Advanced Studies. I'm Ksenia Chmutin, the director of the IS. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Andrea and Mariana. Um, welcome to LAFPRO, welcome to the IIS. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and welcome to all of you here in the International House today. There are quite a few people around. And to those of you joining online, as always, we run a hybrid um, seminar. Um, so IIS, as many of you know, is the hub at LAFPRO University of transdisciplinary exciting conversations where academics, colleagues from across the university, across the disciplines, um, meet with our international fellows um, to discuss the most current topics. And today, I think, is a great example of that when uh, Mariana and Andrea are going to talk to, uh, to us about geographies of, of mobilities. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we start. Um, the seminar is being recorded. There will be a Q&A in the end. So for those of you online, if you have any questions, please post your questions in the little thing on Zoom, and we're monitoring the questions, but the Q&A session will not be recorded. The lecture will then be released on YouTube, just in a couple of hours, Kieran will do his magic, uh, and also as a podcast, so you will be able to listen to this um, as well. Well, once again, welcome, and let me pass over to Professor Heike Jons to introduce our campus today. Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to Mariana Namigo and Andre Nate Noves um, from Brazil and also all attendees here um, in the IS and online. Um, it's a great honor to host Mariana and Andre here in the IS, and I'm very grateful to the director and the colleagues working here uh, to have enabled this uh, visit. Mariana and Andre both work as associate professors of geography at the in Portuguese Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro or the State University in Rio de Janeiro. And they have made significant contributions to both the history of geography and historical geography, particularly in regard to the decolonization of the Anglophone geography curriculum because they have published in English about topics on the history of geography and historical geography that discuss Brazilian case studies and global perspectives from a global south uh, view and point. Mariana received her undergraduate degree and master's degree at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, and she was awarded her PhD at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in 2010. Now she coordinates the Center for Studies and Research on Space and Culture, the NEPEC, and is editor of the journal Revista Espaço e Cultura, and she was founded, funded by the British Academy to spend a visiting professorship in the UK last year. So these close relationships to Britain mean that we can speak uh, in English, given uh, the lack of language skills in Portuguese um, on my side. And uh, so that's very much appreciated. Uh, Mariana's research has studied uh, the politics of geographical knowledge production in Portuguese and French and in English, for example, most recently through a focus on the internationalism of the International Geographical Congress in Rio de Janeiro in 1956, where she showed how important it is to move international conferences to global south context to basically put the work that is done there on the global stage. And then also she's interested in transatlantic exchanges in geography between Brazil and Europe. Andre received his undergraduate master's and PhD degrees in geography from the Federal Republic University of Rio de Janeiro. He is a member of the Commission on the History of Geography of the International Geographical Union and co-editor of the book series, Geographers, Biobibliographical Studies, that publishes biographies of geographers from all over the world. For example, recently, two issues, one specialized on women geographers and one on geographers from South America. His uh, research has recently studied the geopolitics of geographical knowledge and borders in South America and critically interrogate the global north-south divide as a dynamic notion that can be challenged through cross-cultural exchanges like we are doing them 
in this week um, in Loughborough. Mariana Fernandez's IAS visit enables us to continue our transnational collaboration in the context of his Georg Uni, a global research <laughs> network on the historical geographies of the university that is hosted here at Loughborough University and of which Mariana and Andre are members so far. We've only engaged online. So this personal interaction for a week is really valuable. We are looking forward to your presentation on geographical knowledge mobilities in Brazil and the subsequent discussion. So thank you very much for uh, having come along to Lafra. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we want to thank uh, Mike and, and Xenia for, for the introduction. And thanks all the audience. It's a great pleasure to participate in the series in the Institute of Advanced Studies here in Loughborough University. And yeah, and we want to thank all the staff from the university as well for the support that we, we have to spend this week here. So today our seminar is about knowledge and academic mobility in the mid 20th century Brazil. Uh, nevertheless, we'd like to start by remarking that we are moving people studying uh, people's mobility in the past. So looking for our mobilities and encounters in the present may be a nice way to highlight the role of geographical mobilities in the production and circulation of knowledge in different historical and geographical contexts. It was thanks to our academic travels that we met Professor Ai Kions for the first time at the International Conference of Historical Geography back in 2017. Since then, we have had the chance to meet in various other places, such as Paris, London, and now here in Loughborough. We are looking forward to invite Professor Jones to South America <laughs> to visit uh, us and to build new academic networks and collaborate in research projects. Even in our fast-paced digital world, being physically present in different places fosters connection among uh, scientific and academic community fueling transnational research networks. So co-presence is a crucial aspect in our discussion today, which focuses on various instances of scientific travels from different continents to Brazil during the 50s. Our case studies uh, were published in international journals and books, and we are more than happy, of course, to share these pieces if someone is interested in going deeper in our examples and also in our methods that we'll explore today. The first case is a means, is a means how a Portuguese historian, Jaime Cortesão, traveled to Brazil and started a long-term collaboration with Brazilian scholars, resulting in the exhibition to celebrate the fourth centennial of São Paulo City in 1954. The second case, focus on the circulation of science travelers to Rio de Janeiro to attend the 8th IGU International Conference in 1956. So the exhibition and the conference both take place in the historical context of the 50s, showing case the social, political, and cultural environment of Brazil science during that time. In contrast to post-war Europe, Brazilian experience had a high optimistic phase following the Vargas period which established in many modern scientific institutions, the 50s marked a period of enthusiasm in the country's economic and social advances. During this era of modernization, Brazilian politics were heavily focused on a new developed-oriented rhetoric centered on reforms in various sectors of the economy, particularly in energy and transportation. It was also a time of increased internationalization of Brazilian capital, with a rise of U.S. corporations' involvement in the modernization of the Brazilian industrial complex. And of course, geographical knowledge become essential for achieving these political and economic objectives. Geographical institutions, such as the Brazilian Institute of Geogra Geography and Statistics, were living their golden age. The increase of an academic community and intense debates about the past and the future of the country creates a very fruitful context to encompass new transnational scientific networks. The case studies we are about to present address the cultural exchange, power relation, asymmetries, partnerships, and collaborative efforts resulting from academic mobility in this specific historical context. An exhibition and one conference will be the starting point 
for discussing how mobility has influenced the knowledge production and circulation in Brazil and also abroad. So going to our first case, on 10 September 1954, the Brazilian newspaper, o Estado de São Paulo, published one advertisement inviting the audience to an exhibition named History of São Paulo in the Framework of Brazilian History. The display was part of the celebration for the fourth centennial of São Paulo City, and it took place at the Ibirapuera Park, a brand new landmark in the city landscape. The propaganda text highlighted how the audience knowledge will be, quote, enriched by the valuable iconographic material never shown before, end quote. And the selected images, such as the famous Terra Brasilis map, revealed the discursive combination interlocking nationalism and Sao Paulo's identity. Despite its national claims, the newspaper advertised also revealed that the <coughs> exhibition curated was not a Brazilian, but the Portuguese scholar Jaime Cortezão. According to the report, Cortezão visited archives in France, Netherlands, Italy, Portugal to select items for the exhibition. In addition, São Paulo museums and the Indian Museum in Rio de Janeiro also made the collections available for the exhibition. A small, a small group of photographs available at the National Archives in Portugal show the arrival of the material and the preparation of the exhibition. Jaime Cortezão appears in one of the photographs with his characteristic hat standing with authorities and intellectual from Sao Paulo who came together to check the list of items to be displayed. The meeting of this group of men in elegant suites who was together to appreciate the artifacts that arrived from Europe to tell the history of Brazil could be quite revealing of Jaime Cortezão's connections with Sao Paulo's elite. Since the Portuguese scholars moved to Brazil in October 1940, escaping from the war in Europe and the dictatorship in his country, he created a diversified and consolidated network of allies. Considering Jaime Cortesão's mobilities and his contacts with Brazilian historical narratives on identity and cross-cultural encounters, this first session has two goals. Firstly, to describe Jaime Cortesão's trajectories and mobilities in Europe and Brazil, and then to explore his collaboration and controversies with intellectuals from Sao Paulo uh, in, in display exploration and indigenous knowledge in the 1954 exhibition. So Jaime Cortesão was born in 1884 in the city of Ansan in Portugal, but shortly after his birth, his family moved to São João do Campo, where his brother and sister Esther, Judith, Mario and Armando was born. Jaime started his study in medicine in Coimbra, and he moved to Porto in 95, where he acted as a poetry writer and editor of journals with anarchist and republican influences. Uh, on 5 April 1921, Cortesão was appointed as the director of the National Library of Portugal, moving to Lisbon and starting a new cycle of productivity with the creation of the journal Seara Nova and the publication of books in the history of Portuguese colonization. The military cup overthrew the Republic uh, of Portugal in May 1956, influenced Cortesão's subsequent mobilities. He escaped to Spain after a failed revolutionary attempt in Porto in 19, 1927. Nevertheless, the outbreak of the Spanish War forced him to go to France, and the Nazi invasion in Paris pushed Cortesão and his family to Biarritz and later to Portugal, where he, of course, was not well received by the dictatorship government. Exiled by his own country, uh, Cortesão left Europe on 20 October 1940, starting his 70 years exiled in Brazil. Unlike an explorer or a naturalist who came to Latin America to collect natural specimens and compare them in center of calculation in Europe, Cortesão's long period of exile stimulated him to work as a mediator or a go-betweener, combining knowledge from different origins to offer original gazes to Brazilian institutions and archives. Introducing new documents from Portuguese and Spanish sources and reading documents available in Brazilian collections, Cortesão quickly engaged in historical and historiographical debates about cross-cultural exchange and colonization and exploration in Brazil. The mobility of the Portuguese scholars inside Brazil, 
are fundamental elements in understanding how his ideas circulated. Although he set his new home in Rio de Janeiro, it was in Sao Paulo that Jaime Cortesão presented his first lecture in December 1940. Cortesão's growing interest in Brazilian territorial exploration stimulated an intense dialogue with members of the intellectual elite of Sao Paulo, who since the beginning of the 20th century produced historical narratives on Brazilian borders and colonization. To exemplify this dialogue, I would like to stress just two examples. Afonso Toné and Sérgio Buarque de Holanda, both directors of Sao Paulo Museum. The historian, the historian Afonso Toné was the director of Sao Paulo Museum from 1917 and was the Jaime Cortesão's first intellector, uh, interlocutor on the history of Brazilian exploration. In a letter from August 1949, the Brazilian story confirms that he sent his book to Cortesão called The History of, of Bandeiras Paulistas. Jaime Cortesão frequently quoted this book as a reference to study exploration and explorers in Brazil. The dialogues with Afonso Toné intensified Jaime Cortesão's contact with a group of scholars with significant impact on the historiography of Brazilian exploration. Developed what we could call bandeirismo, these authors promoted uh, specific bandeiras, such as the Raposo Tavares one, as a founding myth of the national identity. The impact of Brazilian stories in Jaime Cortesão uh, was manifested in his talks and writings. In a lecture from 1947, for instance, he endorses Raposo Tavares as, and I quote, the most epic and the most novel bandeirante. Cortesão classifies São Paulo's here hero as the most Brazilian of the Lusíadas. Despite agreeing with the local historians, the last sentence of Cortesão talk referring to the Lusíadas show how the Portuguese scholar argued for a Luso-Brazilian identity. Although Cortesão uh, talks was well received, his connection between Bandeirantes' actions on the ground and Portuguese expansionism creates disagreement about some Brazilian scholars, such as Sérgio Buarque de Holanda. Sérgio Buarque de Holanda was a student of Afonso Toné and substituted him as the head of the Museum Paulista in 1946. However, the historiographical position diverged on many points. Holanda positioned himself in a group of scholars who sought to stress Brazilian uniqueness, dissociating the exploration of Brazilian territory from Portuguese heritage. In his book and articles, he criticized Cortesão's excessive emphasis on Portuguese agency, questioning the geopolitical orientation of Bandeirantes and the idea of a loose of Brazilian expansionism. Despite the controversies, the authors constantly quote each other and promote respectful debates about exploration and colonization in Brazilian newspapers. Cortesão's involvement in local debates highlights his immediate position between foreign and national vis-a-vis -vis the Brazilian academic community. He was a, quote, loose Brazilian historian classify as more Brazilian than others. His position in between justified Jaime Cortesão's invitation to curate the exhibition of the fourth centennial of Sao Paulo City in 1954. The exhibition culminates Jaime Cortesão's dialogue with Sao Paulo's intellectual elite, and the artifacts on display could express all his research trajectories in Brazil. At the end of his period exiled from Portugal, Cortesão had the opportunity to present his main ideas to a broader audience who came to visit the Ibirapuera Park. The photographs published in the media suggest that the celebration attracts an audience for high class status. The number of cars bringing men and women in elegant suites and fancy dresses indicates a selective audience. Many activities and exhibitions occur in the park during the celebration. The amusement park, the display of Sao Paulo industry and the international fair gathered many people, and all the attractions were displayed in a map distributed to the public. Although not prominent on the map, the most depicted building uh, in the report's photography was the exhibition policy, the OCA, as we call it nowadays. Located in the left side of the map, the main entrance of the park. Cortesão's exhibition on the history of Sao Paulo was displayed in this prestigious space and occupied two main floors, being widely covered by the media. The magazine Manchette's report described all the sections of the exhibition, praising the display practices used, such as, and I quote, asymmetric divisions, shelves, and light games. Jaime Cortesão narratives 
begun with the original letter of Pedro Vaz Caminha sent to the king of Portugal in the 1500, considered by him as, and I quote, the birth certificate of Brazil. Then Cortesão turns to the Indian and the culture, displaying the works, tools, clothes, ornaments, and the happens. The third section displayed detailed maps to portray old Brazilian political divisions and the pioneer settlements of São Paulo. The bandeira were the topics of the fourth session, where Cortesão used panels and maps to portray territorial exploration. The fifth step deals with gold and colonization, and the sixth displayed maps and diplomatic documents to present the consolidation of Brazilian borders. The last three sections deal with independence, empire, and republic, but Cortesão did not curate these ones. Although all sections could be studied considering Cortesão's trajectories and research in Brazil, I would like to focus my analysis in the panels for two specific sections. Sections two from the culture of Indians and section four on bandeiras and bandeirantes are particular interest to study how Cortesão displayed indigenous cultures and their encounters with explorers. The images circulating in the media could provide useful information on the exhibition as a social event, as many geographers has been working nowadays. Well-dressed men and women carefully analyze indigenous artifacts and pictures, which seems to represent a distant relationship, generating a sense of curiosity and otherness. By consulting Cortesão's documents, it's possible to know exactly what he would like to display in each section and panel. Panel 12, for instance, observed by two men in the photograph, intends to show, and I quote, types and scenes of indigenous lives, portraying a group of Karaja Indians, one Indian woman with ornaments in her head, and two young Indian women. Panel 37, analyzed by a couple in the photograph, display a whole Karaja beach camp with original artifacts, objects such as a canoe, a net, and a ball, uh, were borrowed by the Indian Museum in Rio de Janeiro. The display of indigenous camp aims to show, in Cortesão words, and I quote, how the Indian taught the Portuguese how to survive. The main aim of the section two was to display the encounter of the Portuguese with the Aborigines, in Cortesão words, <laughs> considering how the newcomers interact with diverse forms of indigenous cultures. Quoting Sérgio Guardiola, the Cortesão stated that the Portuguese incorporated, and I quote, process of food, clothing, home, and laser from the natives. Reproducing the terminology used by previous publication, Cortesão presented the colonization as a hybrid process. This hybridism gives a pivotal place to indigenous knowledge in exploration, but also presupposes a very collaborative kind of indigenous people who are available to share their practice with the newcomers and are not an obstacle to colonization. The specific kind of Indian selected by Cortesão is exemplified uh, in the exhibition program, the Tupis. According to Cortesão, mm -hmm. Tupi was selected, and I quote, as a model for indigenous figuration for obvious reasons in this world, due to its close relationship with Sao Paulo's origin. Cortesão stated that Indians provide specific aspects of Brazilian culture and more specifically, the Sao Paulo ones. The length process of encounter led Cortesão to stress that Portuguese explorers were tupinized or become tupi. The category tupi, however, had a larger history in Brazilian historiography, becoming popular during the 19th century when Brazilians had intense debates about national identity. According to contemporary Brazilian stories, such as João Manuel Monteiro, Tupi are, are simplification of the social and cultural diversity that colonizers found among Indians in Brazilian coasts. Travelers used to separate Indians on Tupi, who would be allies of Portuguese, allies of Portuguese colonization and are open to sharing the territorial knowledge, from Tapuias, who are the brave Indians, resistance to civilization and less malleable. Cortesão aligned uh, with these local narratives is quite evident in the first image of the section, uh, uh, second session of his exhibition. The showcase eight, for instance, showed to be artifacts such as a necklace, an ornament. In the right side of images, it it's also possible to see the panel 14, displaying two petticoats of a ritual dance by a Tupi group, according to Cortesão's description. 
By mobilizing the Tupi category during the 20th century, Cortesão followed São Paulo historians, such as Afonso Toné, emphasizing a novel indigenous lineage that would have occupied São Paulo's plateau before the colonization. Once adopting this category, Cortesão also inherits its contradictions and controversies. Sérgio Buarque de Holanda can, for instance, disagree with São Paulo's Tupi's origins, exploring documents from the 60th and the 7th century and the, the work of historian Capistano de Abreu, Holanda showed that São Paulo's inhabitants were Guayanas, who would have a known to be origin. However, denying that Guayanas were to be means that question the credibility of most São Paulo historians, and Cortesão does not intend to challenge this credibility, and the controversy around the ethical origins of, of indigenous from Tietê regions was carefully silenced in his exhibition. The harmonious and complementary Luso Tupi encounters return on the exhibition focus in the fourth session dedicated to the Bandeirante. As well as the Tupi, the Bandeirantes category was taken from the local historiography to define specific characteristics of Sao Paulo's history. The explorer were presented as the, the truly original, specific, and defining fact of Sao Paulo history and consider it as the city's great geographical, social, and political contribution to Brazil. Section four was open with a panel depicting three uniformed and armed explorers. In the background, an indigenous appears showing the direction and orientation of the, the movement. These images could summarize Cortesão's approach to hybridism. Rather than discuss a third race or a blood diffusion, fusion, Cortesão praised how the encounter of two cultures give birth to Banderismo. Along with the image, he wrote, Banderismo resulted from the fusion of two cultures, the Aboriginal, which gave it direction and orientation, and the Portuguese, which gave it military organization and economic and political purpose. To endorse his arguments on Portuguese agency in exploration, Cortesão displayed a series of documents to show how the world, Bandeira, uh, was used in Portugal since 1570 as a synonym of militias or ordinance. When the world arrives in, in Brazil during the 7th century, it progressively raised new meanings. However, boundaries, in its essence, was presented as in the exhibition as, and I quote, an eminently and viscerously Portuguese phenomenon. Cortesão took this sentence from a book by the Brazilian journalist Julio Mesquita Filho, a member of Sao Paulo's elite and owner of the newspaper Estado de São Paulo, where his exhibition was great advertisement, as I showed in the, the beginning of the presentation. The display of a sentence from a local elite member reaffirming Portuguese agency in Bandeiras should be understood in the context of Cortesão's controversies with other Brazilian scholars, such as Sérgio Buarque de Holanda. According to Holanda, by classifying exp exploration as a loser to be practices, Cortesão works to preserve pure and essential uh, entities ignoring the long period of miscegenation and giving essential agency to Portuguese people in Brazilian exploration. As a Portuguese Brazilian historian, Cortesão occupy a place in between the national and the foreign, which allowed him to harmonize his interest in Portuguese expansion with local identity demands. Cortesão made a double movement in his exhibition. On one hand, the curator gave prominence and visualities to Tupi's participation in São Paulo's identity. On the other, he used the Bandeirantes as a category to reinforce Portuguese agency in the production of Brazilian territory. By studying how objects, people, practice, and idea travel over space, historical geographies have demonstrated how place transform and are transformed by knowledge and its mediator. In this section, we argue that Jaime Cortesão's trajectory and exhibition could be understand an interesting example of this mutual influence. The Portuguese scholar trajectories, as an historian, was deeply influenced by Brazilian topics and narratives. At the same time, he remodeled and rethinking many controversial uh, in local historiography, influencing the way that Brazilian historians approach colonization and hybridism during the 50s. This topic were also discussed by Brazilian geography, uh, who were organizing a huge conference during the same period and and, yes, and, and changing the discipline during the 50s. And now I change for Mariana Thorts. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having us. Okay.
Uh, the International Geographical Congress is the oldest and largest geography conference in the world. The idea of creating a global organization of geographers originated in 1871, leading to the first International Geographical Congress held in Antwerp. After the First World War, the International Geographical Union was established in Brussels in 1922 with seven founding members, Belgium, France, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, Japan, Portugal, and Spain. In the early 20th century, IGU members and meetings were permanently concentrated in Europe. However, after the Second World War, the IGU adopted a strategy of expanding beyond Europe, as seen in the Washington Conference in 1952 and the Rio de Janeiro Conference in 1956, and the admission of non-European members. Despite this strategy, it's very worth noting that the Rio IGC was the first, and until today, the only one Congress held in South America. The Rio, the Rio IGC lasted for 10 days and had a packed schedule of activities. These included paper sessions, keynote speakers, local discussions, a map exhibition, uh, long discussions, as well as many social activities. The conference was impressive in scale with over 1,000 participants from 57 countries and in speaking six official languages. And it was the last time that six official languages was accepted in the international conference. Brazil hosting the 18th International Geographical Congress was a significant, significant achievement. The event brought excitement as renewed researchers from all around the world arrived, providing a unique chance for union members to study new geographical issues on site, including physical and human geography of the tropical world. The main newspapers in the country covered the day-by-day -day conference depicted as a chance to challenge misconceptions about the country and enhance national geographical knowledge. Preparation for the, uh, for the first IGU Congress below the Equator began early in 1952. The local organizing committee was very worried about the high travel costs for international members who were used to low cost trips to Congress held in Europe. The local committee was responsible to make every possible effort to ensure the broad participation of the international geographical community that had actively taken part in the previous Congress. Two strategies were deployed to secure the event Sussex. The first one involved increasing publicity to persuade the Brazilian federal government to provide additional financial resources. The organizing committee's marketing strategy involved sending regular secrets to foreign institutions creating a multilingual monthly newsletter for national newspapers and leading scientific journals and conducting radio transmissions in English and French for congressional propaganda every night. The second strategy to ensure broad participation of the international geographical community involved establishing the subcommittee for the placement of foreign participants to connect Brazilian universities and institutions with geographers interested in visiting professor or technical consultant roles. As outlined in the first call for papers, there were opportunities for financial assistance, such as scholarships and travel assistance in exchange for temporary work contracts. It is possible to find the applications in the uh, Institute of Brazilian Geography and Statistics journals from those interested, interested in collaborating with Brazilian institutions. Applications need to specify the intended state duration in the country and language technical skills in Portuguese, Spanish, French, or Italian. A total of, of 30 applications were sent to the organizing committee during the years before the conference and displayed in the journals. The applications were submitted by researchers from different countries. The breakdown of the applications by countries as follows. 10 applications were uh, from researchers in France, four were from researchers in England, two from researchers in the United States, two from Germany, and one for the other countries. I really want to stress four researchers on the list to explore the main 
idea of our talk here today. First of all, it's, it's worth noting that out of the 30 applicants, only two were women. And I started with them. Marguerite Lefebvre, a professor and director of the Geographical Institute of Louvain from Belgium, and Monica Cole, an early career British geographer at the University College, University College of North Strat Staffordshire, later Kiel University. Marguerite, Marguerite Lefebvre had a remarkable career as a geographer. She earned the distinction of being the first woman to defend the geography thesis in France and the first woman to become a professor of the Catholic University of Louvain. From 1949 to 1952, Marguerite served as the first vice president of the International Geographical Union. She represented the Belgian Society of Geographical Studies in Brazil as part of, a small, of the small Belgian delegation. Marguerite co-chaired the section of regional geography and took part in the highly sought after 21-day Congress discussions to the Amazon region. Unfortunately, there are no records uh, indicating that Marguerite's application for a temporary contract in the country was accepted. But Unlike Marguerite, Marguerite, Monica Cole's visit to the country left a notable impact on the archives. Monica's arrival in Brazil was reported by the newspaper Correio da Manhã on April 5, 1956. The article mentioned that the geographer hailing from England was the first Congress participant to arrive in the country. Monica Cole came to Brazil on a scholarship from Itamaraty, the Brazilian Foreign Office appointed by the Education Department of the British Council. During her eight months stay in 1956, Cole conducted extensive surveys of the Cerrado, Caatinga, and Pantanal Savana vegetation to study their origins and distributions. She also focused on, on addressing climate change and geomorphological evolution. Monica particip Cole's participation on the 18th IGC was very intense. She made part in two excursions for the Midwest region, including the Pantanal Mato Grossense, held before the Congress lasting uh, 20 days, and for the State of Bahia, held after the Congress lasting uh, 15 days. During the days of the Congress, Cole got quite busy presenting three papers in three different sessions. Moreover, she was invited to participate in the colloquium, the problem, the problem of savanna, of the savanna tropical regions, presenting her brand new study with data collected in the first excursion she made to the central west region of the country. Monica also attracted media attention, making her a sort of academic celebrity with her name and photos appearing in several newspapers. Here, she's picturing at the cartographic exhibition observing maps of the USSR with a caption that ironically says, England observing Russia. And in another report, shaking hands with a Brazilian admiral. Cole's experience in Brazil is present in at, le in at least three of her papers. The first was published in Portuguese two, after, two years after the Congress in 1958 in the Journal of the Association of Brazilian Geographers entitled A Savona Brasileira. Two other papers were published in English in 1960. The Brazilian Savona was published in the Revista Geográfica of the Pan American Institute of Geography and History and Cerrado, Caatinga, and Pantanal, the distribution and origin of the Savona vegetation of Brazil, was published in the geographical, in the geographical Physical Geographical Journal. Cole's work, published in the Boletim Carioca de Geografia, was widely circulated and is referenced by many geomorphological research, including Aziz Abisabe, who is a very important geographer uh, in Brazil, who mentioned how the real IGC influenced his scientific development through his interactions with international scholars. Cole's research on the savanna, particularly the typology she developed in the 80s, continues to be cited, to be quoted in the works of Brazilian research today. In the paper, the Brazilian Savana, Cole mentions that the field work for, for the article was conducted when she was a research scholar of the Brazilian government. The article also includes a, length, a lengthy list of thanks to individuals and institutions, including Professor Hilga Stamberg, who, who was at the time the first 
uh, Secret Secretary of the IGU, and Fabio Macedo Soares, who was director uh, of the National Council of Geography at IBGE. In the, in the introduction of her paper, her paper, Cole explains that her research on savannas began when she investigated land use issues in the South African savanna from 1948 to 1951. This previous research led her to undertake further studies in the Brazilian savanna. In Brazil, she had been in the states of Paraná, São Paulo, Rio, Minas Gerais, Goiás, Mato Grosso, Alagoas, Pernambuco, Paraíba, and Rio Grande do Norte, names that only Brazilians could understand. <laughs> in the paper Cerrado, Catinga and Pantanal, Cole mentions the National uh, Council for Geography, of Geography for the support provided during uh, the field work. Then the text includes a map showing the very extensive Cole's route for the field work which was conducted by land, water, and air. The two Congress excursions to the Amazon and Bahia greatly contributed to the understanding of the regions discussed in the, studies, in the study. Cole's route aligns with these two excursions. The valuable content found in the guides for discussion was extraordinary. The unique material collected by Brazilian geographers during the research for the guides was published in English and French and shared with all participants of the discussion. Cole's texts are extensively illustrated with image photos from the surveyed regions. Although the photographs do not indicate the author, they bear resemblance to the images from the guidebooks by the National Council of Geography staff. Later in 1987, Cole acknowledged the role of the 18th Congress in the development of studies on the vegetation types of savanna areas in the text, The Savanna, published in Progress in Physical Geography. According to Cole, before uh, 1960, most of the studies of the savanna were made by botanists, botanists and soil scientists. In 1956, the holding of the International Geographical Congress in Brazil provided geographers of, of, with opportunities for studying the Cerrados and Caatinga vegetation. This stimulated research on the savannas that extended beyond considerations of vegetation, soils, relationships, and the role of fire. Okay, from now on, I will focus on two French scholars whose trajectories intertwined with Brazilian geography after the Rio IGC, André Caillé and Jean Tricard, who uh, also um, send application for uh, consultant or professor roles in Brazil. André Caillé was a distinguished paleontologist and geologist. He represented the French delegation and served as official member of the Col Pratique des Autetours à Paris. Caillot attended the Rio IGC as the chairman of the Periglacial Morphology Commission from the 52, from 1952 to 1956. In addition to his commission duties, Caillot did not present any work at the Congress and did not participate in any excursions. After the conference, Caillot received an invitation from the IGU Rio First Secretary, Hugo Sandberg, to give lectures in the Higher Geographical Studies course in Rio de Janeiro. The course was promoted by the Center for Research in Geography of Brazil, which was established, established in 1952 by Sternberg at the University of Brazil. The Higher Education, um, the Higher Geograph Geograph Geographical Studies Program was sponsored by Brazilian High Personal Improvement Campaign and by the Rockefeller Foundation. Kaya was among a select group of researchers who attend the conference that got invited for the Higher Geographical Studies course. Between August and October of 1956, André Caillot, Pierre Biro, Pierre de Fontaine, Pierre Montbeck from France, uh, Irving Herb Reyes, and Gavion Bourne American, Orlando Ribeiro from Portugal, and Cultural from Germany gave classes to over 40 university professors from all regions of Brazil. The course gained attention in the press, particularly in Ocorrer de Manhã, which highlighted the course relevance 
due to the participation of seven of the greatest professors attending the, con the Congress. The newspapers published the course program and included a brief biography of each professor. The program includes several lectures, with the longest being by Professor uh, Pierre de Fontaine, less than 20 lectures, followed by Cartrol with 18 lectures. It is possible to measure the impact of the higher geographical studies course on the development of geographical research in the country through the experience of Brazilian geographers who attend the course. Notably, geographers like Milton Santos, Manuel Correa de Andrade, and Assim Zab Saber, very important uh, geographers to Brazil, benefited from the program. The interaction with international professors during the higher geographical studies led to the establishment of postgraduate programs abroad and long-term collaborations. It's, it is evident that there was a significant increase in the number of, of Brazilian researchers doing PhD studies in French, German, and English universities after the Rio IGC. Milton Santos' experience is not uh, worthy because it is associated with the geomorphologist Jean Tricard that uh, uh, send the, his application as well. Unlike some of his compatriots, frequent visitors such as Pierre de Fontaine, Pierre Mombeck, uh, came several times to Brazil. The 1956 Congress was Tricar's first time in Brazil. Tricar was actively involved in the Congress, presenting an impressive total of four papers across four different sessions. Additionally, he participates in the colloquium on regional planning, planning for of tropical countries. Tricar attended as an individual member and was not part of the French delegation. Despite being a professor at the University of Strasbourg, he did not represent any specific institution. Tricar did not hold any position as chairman chairman of any committee or working session, and and also he did not he did not take part in any of the nine discussions. However, his contribution was highly significant at the 18th Congress. He played a leading role in proposing a new IGU commission at the General Assembly in the field of applied geomorphology. Even though Tricard was a well-respected geographer and an expert in geomorphology, he was not invited by Sternberg to join the Higher Studies course. It was mentioned by Milton Santos in 1989 that it that Tricard's connections with the French Communist Party played a role in the decision. Tricard's view clashed with the conservative, conservative stance of Hugo Stenberg. It is important to note that Milton Santos' statement is quite controversial, as André Caillou, who was sympathetic to Marxism and mentor uh, to Tricard, was invited by Stenberg, despite not being a member of the Communist Party. Anyway, Starbeck did not want Tricard, so Tricard was invited to teach in the geography course at the Faculty of Philosophy of Instituto Lafayette, later the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Professor Miguel Alves de Lima, who is a professor at the Institute and very close to Tricard, was the one who extended the invitation. Tricard had remained in Brazil and gave lectures which conceded with the highest geographical studies course and Milton Santos, a professor at the Catholic Faculty of Philosophy in Bahia, attended both courses. Santos and Tricard developed such great affinity that Santos was invited to do his PhD studies in Strasbourg under Tricard supervision. Santos returned to Brazil in 1958 with his PhD in geography together with young colleagues from Bahia who followed the same path. After returning from France, Milton Santos was given the responsibility of setting up a research group at the University of Bahia in the northwest region of Brazil. He had additional meetings with John Ticard and with the support of the University of Bahia and the technical cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France, the Laboratory of Geomorphology and Regional Studies was established in, on January 1, uh, in 1959, under Milton Santos' leadership. The laboratory was a groundbreaking academic initiative lo located outside the main cities of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. The, 60s, the 1960s marked a high point for geography development in Bahia and the North, where, North, where the States, uh, region in Brazil. 
Santos played a pivotal role in advancing geographical research by bringing in many French professors to give lectures, teach courses, hold seminars, and supervise the fieldwork. Tricá maintained close relations with Brazil throughout his life, making several return trips to Bahia and Rio de Janeiro. He took part in, he took part, part in many courses at the IBGE at the invitation of Miguel of Lima. And in 1975, uh, Tricá attended a series of conferences at the IBGE, which eventually led to the publication of his book in, por in Portuguese called Eco Dinamica. In the first sentence of the book introduction, Chekar writes, I have been a Brazil friend for about 20 years since I had begun working in this country. I had this fantastic opportunity at the International Geographical Congress in 1956, organized by the BGE and supported by the work of its children. Therefore, it's always an enormous pleasure to get back in touch with the BGE staff as well as with other Brazilian institutions. Okay, the examples we discussed today highlight the importance of place in the production of geographical knowledge and the significance of movement, translation, and transmission processes. Scientific interactions such as exhibitions or conference, like those in our case studies, give us insights into scientific knowledge that goes beyond national borders and national styles. As we aim to argue, there is no scientific knowledge without mobility and a transnational network of bodies and artifacts. The mobilities and interactions of people, texts, images, and objects could support the claim that, making, that the making of geography was and is a transnational and international endeavor. This is not to say that the international circulation of, of knowledge was a unique condition of or particularity in, develop, in developing geographical practice in the global south. In reality, mobility play a consistent role in shaping various national styles of geography worldwide. Exemplifying a transnational history of science, scholars such as Jamie Portezan, Monica Cole, and Jean Tricard, among many others, contributed significantly to building Brazilian geography while having their own careers, ideas, and theories profoundly influenced and shaped by the, their encounters with Brazilian partners and the country's territory. The development of Histoire Rosé focus on the combination of archives from different sources and venues could allow the identification of recipro reciprocal reciprocal influences between diverse academic and epistemic communities. This will out address the circulation of knowledge beyond the national schools that for a long time characterized the historiography of Brazilian geography. And here we go. Thank you so much for your attention.